All right, now before we wrap this trip up, we wanted to do one more Q&A session. Now, some of these questions are questions that you submitted. Some of them are actually things that we discussed over the last several days that I thought would be good to get out there in a video somewhere. So are you ready for another, uh, another drilling under the, under the light here? Yes, sir. Okay. How come you can't use a laser outdoors? Really simply put, lasers are different than almost any other kind of light out there. Basically, your standard light, a spotlight, DJ light, whatever, starts small and expands very big as it goes forward through space. A laser is called uh, actually a coherent light source, meaning it is very, very narrow and keeps its power over very long distances. Um, the reason why it's dangerous to use a laser outdoors is that even a reasonably low power laser can literally project for miles. Uh, with sometimes a very, very small loss in power. So you can start with a, you know, a 30 milliwatt laser and four or 500 yards away, you still have a 30 milliwatt laser or thereabouts. Whereas a standard DJ light or a spotlight or whatever expands so quickly that the power is just lost as it goes forward through space. So it can get pretty dangerous pretty quickly. The other thing is um, it, here in the US, uh, from January 1st to February 20th of this year, 2009, just about six Six weeks, six, yeah, all, we're talking about. almost seven weeks. There have been 148 separate instances of people shooting lasers at airplanes. Uh, this is obviously really dangerous. It can distract pilots. Uh, very high-powered lasers can cause flash blindness if you shoot it right in a pilot's eyes. You really, really, really don't want to use lasers outdoors, um, especially because now it's being investigated by the FBI because there are so many people shooting lasers at airplanes. Not a good idea. Now, speaking of that, you were saying that uh, because of this, uh, they have really stepped up on policing this stuff. Oh yeah, it's kind of a lead yeah. into the next question: Who are the laser police, and you know why should we really worry about it? People say to us all the time, "Oh, you know, who cares? Why does it matter? There's no such thing as a laser police." Well, actually, there are. Um, there's a branch of the FDA that's known as the CDRH, the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. They're the ones that actually police lasers um, and actually pretty much anything that emits radiation. They police tanning beds, believe it or not. Um, and um, there are uh, actually uniformed naval officers that go around and inspect laser shows, uh, respond to complaints. There are civilian contractors, and believe it or not, in post 9-11, even in many cases, your local fire marshal has been trained in laser safety. Because of all these issues with people using lasers outside and uh, the uh, glut of lasers that are coming in from overseas, lots of people have started getting trained and any one of them have the power to shut down your show and refer you to the FDA uh, for what can be some pretty heavy fines. Um, worst case scenario, you're looking at about $300,000 per use per day uh, and not more than five years in jail for using an uncertified and or unvariant laser system. That's a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, now, that's like worst case scenario, but I mean, minimally, your show is going to get shut down and your, your equipment's going to get impounded and probably destroyed. Let's not let that happen. <laughs> uh, here, here's a question. How can a 50 or 100 uh, milliwatt laser still be class 3A? Because class 3A is supposed to be 4.9 or less. Right, but it's supposed to be up to 5 milliwatts. Um, this can get really technical really fast, so I'm going to give you just sort of like a general answer. Um, the classifications, 3A, 3B, is not based upon how much power the laser diode generates. It's based upon how much laser light is actually emitted from the fixture under a series of tests established by the FDA. For instance, um, the DVDRW or CDRW that's there in your computer right now has got a 250 milliwatt laser in it, thereabouts, but it's class one. Why? Because no laser light actually ever gets outside of the drive. So you can have a 2 billion watt laser inside of a sealed system and it's going to be class one. Uh, similarly, you take a product um, uh, like our Pyro um, and you take a 50 milliwatt source, you break it up many, many times into many, many smaller beams and under the measurement test as established by the FDA, you can't get more than five milliwatts into the eye in any one area of that beam, which makes it allowed to be class 3A. Right on. Okay, here's a question that I came up with and I didn't even give you a heads up that I was going to ask it. Okay. And we talked about this a couple days ago. I thought it was interesting and I'll probably have to do take two of this video because it's going to be a long explanation. All right. Why do you only have to apply for a variance and not actually hold a variance before you can use an FDA approved class 3B or class 4 laser? That's a really good question. Okay, and in fact, I can probably do this pretty shortly. All right. Yeah, let's see how that works out. 
Long story short, uh, throughout the mid to late 90s, there were lots of people that were applying for variances um, and they couldn't get them. Uh, in some cases, people would be planning to do uh, you know, 50, 60 watt lasers in big stadiums outdoors and they'd, they'd apply for their variance years, literally sometimes two years before they'd actually have to use it. And it was just taking too long they to get variances. They still were getting it after two years. Right, and, yeah. it, and it was just taking too long. So um, there was actually a lawsuit um, against the, the government. It's called a restraint of trade complaint, which basically says stuff's taking too long. And they cited a federal rule that the federal government, the U.S. government, has to respond to any inquiry you make to the government within 30 days. That's true for the IRS, for the FDA, for whatever. So basically, uh, what they said was, yes, it's going to take a long time to get a variance approved, but the new guidance says that in the meantime, as long as you have a properly filed variance application, as long as you are adhering to the terms of your variance, and as long as you're using a certified laser projector, you can use it while you're waiting for the final approval of your variance. You just have to keep all the paperwork with you and uh, make sure that that's kosher. But you cannot use a variance until, excuse me, you cannot use a laser until that paperwork is properly filed. Um, and in fact, you should not be able to even get your hands on a laser until that paperwork has been filed properly. And Filing it, meaning it's been filled out properly yep. and put in the mail, is that uh, or postmarked? Yeah, is that yeah. You you fill out all of the paperwork uh, either through our Easy Variance Kit or on your own. Good, good luck with that. Um, and uh, then you drop it in the mail at postmarked. In about thirty days, you actually get a letter back from the FDA saying, "Hey, just want to let you know we got this. We assigned it this docket number. Yada yada yada." You keep all that stuff together with you. You go out and do your show. Be safe, and you should have no worries. I've been waiting since July, and, and no variance yet. But I can still use my laser because I did get I got two letters actually from them. Oh really? Yeah, repeating. Yeah, we still have it. We we still haven't approved it. We have it. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. We're gonna do a, another part of this video because I think we ran a little long. So uh, here, stay tuned for the next piece.